This is Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to see what happened when sin came into the world. So Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So number one. When sin came into the world, Eve was hanging with the wrong crowd. And Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 1, 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Proverbs twelve twenty six, The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. Deuteronomy 7, 3-4, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto his son. For they will turn away from thy son, turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So when sin came into the world, Eve was hanging out with who she wasn't supposed to be hanging out with. And over and over in the scriptures you find warning of being around people that you shouldn't be around. Exodus thirty four twelve through 16 says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. And when Eve was hanging out with the wrong crowd... She ended up getting a false god. What was the false god? Trying to get knowledge some other way than God wanted her to. Uh, the devil became our god. She tro chose what the devil wanted over what God wanted. And Paul says we shouldn't be une unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If you hang around with someone who is against God, then you'll end up going against God. And Eve was hanging out with a Bible corrector. And she ended up being a Bible corrector. Uh, Genesis 3.1, it says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan beguiled her. He charmed her through his subtlety. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The next thing we see that when sin came into the world, Eve was unfamiliar with the word of God. And I wouldn't spend too much time listening to someone, a preacher or a teacher, who corrects the Bible. He will rub off on you. He will get you doubting the word of God. And Eve was hanging out with the spirit who is behind the new Bible versions. And she changes what God says herself. This is what God really told Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
And Eve added the phrase, neither shall ye touch it. When she's telling the devil what God said in Genesis 3, she also said the phrase, lest ye die, instead of thou shalt surely die. So she added words, took away words, and lessened the severity of the consequence of eating off the tree. Now verse 4 of chapter 3 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And he goes completely contrary to what God actually said. He says, Ye shall not surely die. And it's just like that today. God tells you not to do something, then gives a consequence if you do it, and then the devil tells you that there are no consequences for your actions. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So the devil lied to Eve. There's consequences for what you do. If you do something bad, you're going to have a bad consequence. And she did die. She paid the consequence for her sin. And most Bible correctors will change the Bible to fit their belief instead of changing their beliefs to fit the Bible. And if you use the new version of the Bible, then you are going to be unfamiliar with the Word of God, like Eve was. And when sin came in the world, she was unfamiliar with what God said, and it got her in trouble. The serpent beguiled Eve. And if you doubt that the serpent is the devil, then look at these verses. In Revelation 12, 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the devil isn't a fallen angel. He was the anointed cherub who hung around the throne of God. Uh, cherubs are said to have a face like an ox, and that is why the devil gets cursed above all cattle. He is old split foot, as they call him. So you need to get familiar with the Word of God. You need to put on the whole armor of God so that you're not affected by the wiles of the devil. Next, we see that when sin came into the world, she tries to better herself without God. In Genesis 3, and verse 5, it says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So notice the devil tells one lie in verse 4 when he said, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. And then the rest of the things he says are true. Her eyes were opened, and she was made to know good and evil. Uh, the devil said, Ye shall be as gods. Uh, Eve liked this. She's trying to better herself and make herself better than God made her, make herself better without God. And this ver the verse seems to indicate that she knew who the gods were. Uh, maybe she could see them floating around. The gods were the fallen angels who rebelled with the devil. And Psalms 82 says, They are gods, but they shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So Eve wanted the knowledge. She wanted to better herself without going to God. She was already perfect, and God made her without sin. She would have had the perfect voice, the perfect smell, sight, figure, the perfect everything. But the eyes of man are never satisfied. She couldn't get satisfied with what God had already gave her. In Genesis 3, 6, And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that was it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So when you sin, you look at something, you desire it, and then you take it. All the trees in the garden are said to be pleasant to the sight. All of them. However, something different about this tree is that it was the one she wasn't allowed to eat off of. And you can compare that to your life today. Your wife looks pretty good, yet you want everybody else's wife that you're not supposed to have. Your car is nice. Your house is nice, but you like your friends better. Uh, God has already blessed you, but you still want to take some things that isn't yours. You want to take some things that the devil offers. 
Eve wanted something more than God gave her. The devil offered it, and she took it. The celebrities want something more. The devil offers it, they sell their soul. The druggie wants to forget about the life God gave him. The devil gives away. They take it. They get addicted to drugs. Uh, a mother doesn't want her kid. The devil offers a way out through abortion. Uh, you can't wait until you're married to sleep with someone. And the devil says, go ahead and do it. Uh, he'll, he'll say, you won't get an STD. You won't get pregnant before marriage and ruin your life. Uh, the devil's message is positive, just like the false prophet. And you get so far into sin that you don't even want in the presence of God anymore. And that is what happened to Adam and Eve. So when sin came into the world, Adam and Eve hid themselves from God. In Genesis 3, 7 through 8, it says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So they were ashamed of being naked. And that is the right kind of reaction to nakedness. After the fall, it would be wrong to show someone your nakedness. And that is why the devil possessed man in the, in the Gospels was said to be clothed and in his right mind after he got rid of the devils. Adam and Eve were more innocent or as innocent as a little child before the fall. They walked around naked with no shame, just like a child. They would also rather eat fruit than to eat vegetables. And then they hid. Uh, kids do all that stuff, but you can't hide from God. Psalms 90 and verse 8 says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. So God already seen those sins you commit, so you might as well not even hide. Confess your sin because he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. That includes the wicked movies. That includes the pornography. That includes the wicked music. That includes your lustful eye. Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Adam and Eve tried to cover their sin with fig leaves. And you're better off to just say, God, I did it, you know it, and I'm wicked, so please forgive me. Realize you deserve what's coming to you. If somebody gives you a hard time the next day at work, realize God probably let the devil put it in their hearts to give you a hard time just because you need to be chastened. When trouble comes, you need to just say, I deserved that, God. And that's probably for a sin I committed last week. Genesis 3, 7 through 8, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And if Jesus Christ is the word, I guess he's the voice. This looks like the angel of the Lord walking in the garden. Imagine somebody trying to hide themselves from the presence of the Lord when he is omnipresent. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been in sin and closed the Bible, put it on the shelf, and put it, something on top of it because you can't look at the Bible living like you're living? You're doing just like they did. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So Eve was deceived. And Adam knew he was doing wrong, and he did it anyway. He listened to his wife because he loved her. 1 Timothy 2.14 says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Paul warns against women preachers because they are more easily deceived than men. And how many women preachers do you know who use the King James Bible? How many women preachers do you know who believe the Bible and actually go by what it says? Women are easily deceived, and that's why God doesn't have them as teachers. And it's just something that's passed along all the way till now, just like painful childbirth. But when sin came into the world, so did consequences. 
Genesis three fifteen through 20 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The woman's seed is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will bruise the head of the serpent. Romans sixteen twenty says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So God has knocked out the devil all throughout Scripture, and he is going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Genesis 3.15 gets fulfilled at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is when Jesus Christ will bruise his head. Psalm 68.21 says, But God shall wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp of such an one as goeth on still in his trespasses. Jesus Christ was crucified at the place of the skull. The cross was stabbed right into that place. That place of the skull, picturing Jesus Christ wounding the head of the serpent. Goliath was wounded in the head. Sisera was wounded in the head. The Antichrist gets wounded in the head. The devil and his men get their heads knocked off all throughout the Bible. And that's because Jesus Christ is going to bruise the head of the serpent. Also notice that the devil has a seed. That's who the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bruise. Genesis three fifteen through 20 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The devil's seed will be the Antichrist. He gets a deadly head wound. He gets his head bruised, just like all the devil's men in the Bible. And verse 16 says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now the woman's desire is to be ruled by her husband, or to rule her husband to this day. And things in the Adamic covenant that came about as a result of them breaking the Edenic covenant still apply to today. A woman still has painful childbirth. Verse 17 says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and in the dust shalt thou return. And this right here runs through, runs clear through every dispensation in the Bible. And this is why it is best to look at the Bible through covenants and not dispensations. Things from each dispensation can overlap other dispensations just like these things. And if you say, well, this dispensation's a period of time here... And all that stops, and then you go on to the next dispensation, and then all that stops, and you go on to the next one. That's not as good as looking at it through the covenants and seeing that things in these covenants will apply from the beginning to the end. At Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam could have spent the rest of his life with Eve, eating free fruit and never sweating a drop, but he listened to his wife, and it caused sin to come into the world. Verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. So Adam named his wife just like he did the animals. What if you could name your wife? What would you call her? Adam got to name his wife. He got to name the animals. He had been given dominion over all the animals. Uh, he had his own garden. I mean, the world was his. He was king of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven at the same time. And he blew it. He ate the fruit. Uh, Genesis three twenty one through 24 says, And Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them, I bet they felt bad because they caused the first animal death. God had to take a lamb, most likely, 
and, and slay it for their sin. He showed them that those fig leaves aren't a proper sacrifice for sin. He showed them it has to be a blood sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Just like today, if you don't have the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on your soul, then you're lost. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. That would be the Godhead. Become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So Adam blew it. He did get his eyes open to know good and evil, but he was better off the way he was before. And if he was to take from the tree of life and eat the fruit, then he could live forever in his sinful state, and God didn't want this. He doesn't want man to live forever in their sinful state, and that's what men are trying to accomplish today through transhumanism, where they're gonna make they say they're gonna make themselves immortal so they can live, you know, two hundred, three hundred years longer. But who wants to live forever in a wicked, sinful body that's trying to get a glorified body without God? That's a counterfeit. What you want is a real glorified body that you can get at the rapture. When our vile body will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. If you're born again, then when Jesus Christ comes back to get his saints, your body's going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and you're going to get a body that's going to live forever without sin. And if Adam would have taken of the tree of life after he sinned, he would have lived forever as he could live forever as a sinner. And that's why God placed cherubims to guard the way. He didn't trust man to stay out of the garden. If he couldn't trust him the first time, then he can't trust him the second time. So he's got them cherubims there guarding the way of the tree of life. And who knows how long these cherubims would have been there. They could have been there all the way up to the flood, probably. And all these people and kids would be walking by the garden and, and see the cherubims standing there holding a flaming sword. I doubt there was any atheists at this time. Uh, there was too many strange things going on like that. Too many uh, sons of God walking around and cherubims that you could visibly see with your eyes. And you have a sin nature. It's passed down all the way from Adam. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. But the Lord Jesus Christ, who was sinless, died on the cross to pay for your sin debt. And the Bible says in Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that means if you want to be saved, put your trust on Jesus Christ. Don't just believe that he's real. Don't just believe that he existed somewhere in time, but actually put your trust on Jesus Christ alone to be your Savior. Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So if you want to be saved... Come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and put your faith on him to be saved. The Bible says in Romans ten thirteen, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's going to save any person. No matter the bad things you did before you're saved, that doesn't matter. You can be saved regardless of the bad things that you've done. And then he promises to keep you saved regardless of what happens after you got saved. What you did before salvation and what you've messed up and done after salvation doesn't affect the salvation. Those things are a separate issue. But the 
gospel is simple. It's simple to be saved. It's easy to believe. People are against easy believism. They're not really against it. What they're really against is easy prayerism, where someone says, well, I prayed this prayer, so, so I'm saved. Now, someone could get saved while they prayed a prayer, but the prayer isn't what saves them. It's the what they believed in their heart. If a man believes on the Lord Jesus Christ in his heart, then he's saved. If he just prayed a prayer and nothing took place in his heart, then he's not saved. And that's easy prayerism. When a soul winner goes around and says, here, pray this prayer and it'll save you, and the person just says it to get rid of them. That's easy prayerism. That's not salvation. But it's easy to believe. Easy believism is a good thing. I mean, it's easy to believe. And if you actually believe, then you're saved. But what people are against is easy prayerism. But there is nothing wrong with praying a prayer when you get saved. When I got saved, I said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. And I'm relying on you as my crucified, buried, and risen Savior. I'm not relying on my own works. I want you to save me. And what took place in my heart at that time is what saved me. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And the th what was coming out of my mouth and whatever I was doing at the time was just outward evidence of what was taking place inside. If someone says for you to come up to the altar and be saved, the walk to the altar isn't what saves. It's just the outward evidence of what's going on inside. But anyone can be saved, and you need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ before it's entirely too late. But this has been Genesis 3 on how sin came into the world.